series is all about solutions and congruence, mixtures, essentially. And solutions in particular are extremely important for modern chemistry for at least two reasons. The first reason is that most reactions take place in solution these days. And so understanding the properties of solutions will give us insight into how to run and how to improve reactions. And the second is that most consumer products, almost anything you'll deal with that is a consumer product that is a liquid, is a solution or some kind of mixture, perhaps a colloidal dispersion. So again, understanding the properties and behavior of solutions and other types of mixtures is going to give us insight into how those products work and how to improve them. So in this series of videos, we're going to focus on five aspects of solutions and colloids. First, zeroing in on the dissolution process itself, focusing on how intermolecular forces change as a solution is prepared by mixing a solute and solvent, and the thermodynamics associated with the changes that take place when a solution is prepared. In the second section, we'll look at a specific class of solutions containing ions, dissolved solute ions. These are known as electrolytes, and they have interesting properties such as the ability to conduct electricity. In the third section, we'll dive into solubility. We'll look, for example, at how solubility depends on the phase of the solute, whether it is a gas or a solid, and look at the temperature dependence of solubility for these two different types of, of solutes, and dig a little bit deeper into the idea that for a given solute and a given solvent, there is a limit to how much solute can be dissolved. This is known as the solubility limit, or just the solubility. Solutions have a variety of properties that are different from the pure solvent. And many of these can be placed under the umbrella of what are called colligative properties. The idea with colligative properties, and the word colligative in particular, is that the identity of the solute is not so important. It's the number of dissolved solute particles that gives rise to these properties. And they're all some form of a difference or a differential between the pure solvent and the solution, things like freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. We'll dig into the origins of those, how to do calculations involving those, and other interesting aspects of colligative properties. And my favorite thing about colligative properties, just to give a little teaser for what's coming later, is that they are purely entropic in nature. They have nothing to do really with enthalpy and everything to do with entropy. And the fact that they do not depend on the identity of the solute is a good indication that that's the case. We'll dig into the details of that in that section. And then finally, we'll look at colloids, which are intermediate between solutions, which are definitely homogeneous mixtures, and suspensions, which are still best called heterogeneous, since there are really, for example, solid and liquid phases mixed in a suspension. Colloids are sort of in the middle, a kind of meso phase, and that gives them some interesting and unique properties that we don't see in other types of mixtures. Let's start by digging into the dissolution process itself, focusing on those intermolecular forces and the thermodynamics involved as a solution forms. First things first though, let's recall what we mean by a solution. A solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture of solids, liquids, or gases. The solute and solvent can have any of those phases. There are minor components and there may be more than one. In fact, that is very, very common that solutions have more than one solute. But there must be one component that is present in the greatest amount. And this is defined as the solvent. Examples of solutions are shown in this table. Air we can think of as a solution of oxygen, the solute, and nitrogen, the solvent. Both are gases in this case, and so this is a fully gaseous solution. Gases can be dissolved in liquids, such as we see in soft drinks with gaseous CO2 dissolved in liquid water. Hydrogen is a gas and can be dissolved in a solid, solid palladium. Rubbing alcohol is a liquid-liquid solution with solute water dissolved in solvent isopropyl alcohol. Salt water is a solution of a solid, ionic solid, NaCl, in liquid water. And when those ions dissolve, they separate into aqueous Na plus and Cl minus. And there are even solid and solid solutions, such as brass, where solid zinc is dissolved into solvent copper, creating a solid alloy containing the two metals. So these solutions go to show you that the solute and solvent can have any phase, one thing worth pointing out, though, is that the phase of the overall solution is most typically the phase of the solvent, since it is the major component 
and tends to dominate the phase behavior. An example of the preparation of a potassium dichromate solution is shown on this slide. Potassium dichromate is an orange solid. We see it here. And when it's placed in water, a solution is produced through two distinct conceptually anyway processes. Dissolution is the conversion of the solid into an aqueous phase, its incorporation into the liquid phase. Dissociation is the separation of the potassium and dichromate ions into these separate aqueous dissolved components. Those are conceptually distinct, and we'll come back to this distinction between dissolution and dissociation at a few different points. And so again, we can think about this as solid potassium dichromate combining with water to produce an aqueous solution. And the aqueous solution is homogeneous, uniformly orange throughout, still in the liquid phase because water is the dominant component, but containing dissolved K plus and Cr2, O7, 2 minus ions. This slide lists five key defining traits of solutions. Number one, they are homogeneous. This means that they have uniform composition throughout. We cannot find, even all the way down to the submicroscopic level, a distinct heterogeneity at any point within the structure. The second defining trait is something we've noted already. The physical state of a solution is typically the same as that of the solvent, since the solvent is the major component. The components of a solution are dispersed on a molecular scale. What we find if we go down to the submicroscopic level is that each solute particle is surrounded by a shell of solvent species. We say that the solute particles are solvated by the solvent. And the picture in our mind's eye should be each solvent particle, which I've shown here as a filled in circle, surrounded by a sphere or perhaps multiple layers associating even of solvent particles around the solute at the middle. Dissolved solute will not settle out or separate. This distinguishes solutions from suspensions. And finally, the composition of a solution can be varied. We can change the composition of a solution by varying how much solute is dissolved. So the concentration of solute can vary continuously, but only up to a limit. And that limit is known as the solubility or solubility limit.